Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Are you still awake? So we're going to make you sleep. So the question to you is, why are we discussing Alti and Brew? Because there is a change, right? So is that change related to guidelines, or is that change related to literature? So what? Literature or guidelines? Evidence or uh, evidence? Okay. Eminence. Okay. So that's another, another change. So when we talk about ALTI, are we changing the name or attitude? Where do we stand? We want to change both. Excellent. So at this point of time, ALTI have been really hurting us all, right? Is it? Was it? Yeah? Aberrant life-threatening event, long-term. People are worried about it. Everybody talks about the child who's coming in a neonate. If I see a neonate, he's ulti. It doesn't matter what he has. I don't care. He is already ulti. Though by definition, it's supposed to be his mother that's talking about ulti, not us. But because we are ER and we are, you know, taking care of the old people, once we see small children, you are ulti, beyond doubt. So you're going to be admitted. Now, we are not trying to change the name, but we're definitely trying to change attitude. So people have been diagnosing ALTI to everybody, left and right. So what guidelines are coming to say, maybe not every child or every neonate that comes through the door is labeled ALTI. Can we do that? Can we try to help lower down the number of admissions? Can we try to help down really look at delineating who is the patient that I should give all my care to. And that's what we're going to try to discuss today. So ALTI, by definition, it's an episode that is frightening to the observer and that is characterized by some combination of apnea, okay, central or occasionally obstructive, color change, marked change in muscle tone, choking or gagging. Okay? So the observer fears that the infant has died. And that's the pure definition of ALTI. That's what people are fearful of. Now, if a mother comes to you with this picture, are you, are you going to calm her down and tell her your baby is not going to die? Be careful. Don't worry about it. Are we going to be able to do that? It's alerting to us. And as a, as a matter of fact, the, 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 the definition makes us worry because we don't want to see this occurring again in this infant. If it occurs again, then there is a problem, and we have missed the diagnosis of this patient. So it accounts for 0.6 to 0.8% of emergency department visits, and occurs in 0.6 to 2.46 per 1,000 life-born infant worldwide. So the incident is not really that huge. But when we listen to the term, we start shaking, right? Common. We fear the unknown, and that's really human. So we don't have a problem with that. Now, we're going to talk about a brief, resolved, unexplained event. Another beautiful terminology. Okay? I, I applause for the uh, ladies of uh, Russia that presented something about ultrasound and their posters outside. If you haven't seen it, please go visit and see it. They're trying to formulate, again, small abbreviations that can help us diagnose and manage. So a brief, resolved, unexplained event means it's brief, it has resolved, it's unexplained, but you can send the patient home. So that's what tells you. So if you want to believe that, then you have to look at what it describes. So it describes an event that occurs in a child younger than one year of age. So they have a specific rules now. It, he has to be less than one year of age. If he's above one year of age, brew does not apply. Now, it has to be lasting less than one minute, typically 20 to 30 seconds. So anybody who lasts more than one minute, he's not brew. Okay? Now, in addition, he has one or more of the following. So it has to be one or more. So central cyanosis or balor, a patient who comes with discoloration of the face, gums, or the trunk, not acrocyanosis, or only perioral cyanosis. So it has to be a central cyanosis or balor, uh, not rubber or redness by coughing. He has to have an absent or decreased or irregular breathing. In addition, either one or more. And this absent or decreased irregular breathing should be some central or obstructive or mixed apnea, and not periodic breathing or breathing, breath-holding spills, 
And also, he may have a marked change in tone, either hyper hypotonia or hypertonia. So if he has one or more of these, he fits the criteria of Brew. Okay? Altered level of responsiveness. He will fit the criteria. Now, it has to resolve and the patient returns to baseline. Again, a child or an infant who is less than one year of age. It lasts less than one minute. Okay? It has one or more of the four cyanosis, okay, central cyanosis or valor, absent decrease of irregular breathing, a marked change in tone, and altered level of consciousness or responsiveness. If he fits these, then you can label him as bro, okay, which is brief, unexplained event. So he has a reassuring history, physical exam, and vital signs during the AD evaluation that are completely normal. If he fits that criteria, call him Brew. Now, only when another condition cannot be dis discerned as the etiology of the event, we call him Brew. So we excluded here with Brew, on this category of patient, the regular bronchitis patient who comes to you coughing, may have episodic cyanosis, uh, but he is having a diagnosis. He is known to have bronchitis. So he's not going to be called Brew, even though he had cyanosis, though. We're not going to call him Alti anymore, okay? And because of his event, he may be Brew because he has a diagnosis. So, but we're not really yet sure of the diag of the etiology. Now, the lower risk for having a serious underlying condition are older than 60 days. So if they are older than 60 days, they fit the low risk criteria. If they are gestational age, 32 weeks or greater, and a post-conceptional age of 45 weeks or greater. He is a low risk. First brew, first attack of brew. No previous brew ever, and not occurring in clusters. This is a low risk. Not requiring CBR by a trained medical provider. This is a low risk. No concerning historical features, which include history concerning for potential abuse, family history of sudden death, social and environmental issues relating to how small problems, previous child protective services or law enforcement involvement, and current level of concern and anxiety of the family. So if he, if he has these four, he is a low risk of having a serious underlying condition. In which era, at this point of time, you're going to say he's a very low risk. I still can observe him at home. Okay? Now, remember, the strict guidelines that they put is just because they want to protect these patients from being missed. So you have to apply the criteria. If you're going to go with the guidelines, then you have to apply the criteria appropriately. So no concerning physical examination finding is an additional low risk. So if you don't have any history problems, no physical exam problem on him on examination, not requiring CBR, first brew, he is not fit, he's in the gestational age 32 weeks or greater, and post conception age of 45 weeks or greater, and he's older than 60 days, he's a low risk patient. We're going to talk about what happens to them. When we, when we sit down, what, what is, what is, what's wrong with the guidelines? So uh, what do we need to do for them? Definitely medical stabilization. So don't forget little nonates can be tricky and deceptive. Check capillary refill, check glucose early. And always remember that if you don't do these, these are the regular things that you do on every neonate that you see. Okay? Uh, history and physical. Definitely remember that the foundation upon which we will build all medical decisions is really related to the history. And that's why I always depend on, on come and say, if the mother is telling you something worrisome, you should be worried. So, if the mother doesn't tell you something worrisome, she says that, by the way, it, uh, he was uh, shaking his hands. For her, she doesn't understand what shaking his hand means. But for you, it's worrisome. But she's not complaining of it. You need to find the reason for it, though. But at this point in time, she doesn't have the conceptual look at the symptoms and signs. So you need to make sure that you understand what you're looking for. Abnormal vital signs, history and physical exam consistent with a specific diagnosis. This is not a broom. Example, a neonate who comes in with fever and he's lethargic. And mother saying, he's not feeding well. He's septic. Are you going to say he's broom? No, he's septic. The same thing occurs with a bronchitis child. Same thing with the mother saying that baby is feeding. He's feeding very well. But every time after feeding, he regurges and... He turns blue. This is what? Brew or refluxing? So this is reflux. 
So certain items that is related to a diagnosis, they are not brew. The history and physical meets brew criteria, no other explanation, then it's brew. Even if brew consider the broad diag differential diagnosis that exists, okay? Uh, we try to narrow down the most likely culprits to help guide evaluation and workup, cardiac versus pulmonary, neuro versus GI, um, not zebras versus horses, of course. Now, to risk to stratify brew, we need people to fit the low risk criteria. So, yes, if they fit the low risk criteria, then he's a lower risk. Not, then he is considered high risk. Now, we need to remember that lower risk does not equate to no risk. When we say lower the risk, we're trying to avoid thinking of ALTI. Remember, the guidelines is coming to really alleviate the fear of ALTI from our minds. So that means that if he is not fitting the low risk, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have a, a, a risk at all. So what do we do? If he's a high risk, nobody will doubt this, right? You will hospitalize him immediately. Then you'll do the full investigation to, to delineate what is his problem. Uh, what is the most likely cause of his problem, right? Uh, if he's a low risk, we avoid the admission. We, so we avoid indiscriminate labs or imaging studies, not helpful in this group either. Empirically prescribing of GI meds, acid suppression medications, unless you are diagnosing an episode of, of GERD, in which case it's not a brew. Admission solely for cardiopulmonary monitoring. So we try to avoid this in the low risk. If we can, then we'll be able to really manage them to go home with. What do we need to do? It's reasonable to obtain a 12 lead EKG. Some advocate for pertussis testing. Uh, monitor the child in the AD and perform serial exams. Now, one to four hours seems reasonable, no solid evidence. Uh, remember when we talked about the ALTI people, how long you have been observing ALTI in the hospital? A lot of people may have different guidelines, different rules saying, well, I'll put him for eight hours and if he's doing well, maybe we can observe him in the floor. Though the original definition of ALTI is an admission of this patient because of his condition to where? To the ICU, right? So this is the original definition. So now we are really changing. So establishing stability of vital signs and exam may witness another event that assists in the diagnosis. And that, how, how does it assist in the diagnosis if you see an, another event? How does it do that if you see another event? What hint does it give you? If you see the event while he's doing this, what does that mean? It's a seizure, right? So there may be a reason for it that you can explain. Uh, educate the family, so we need to discuss brew with them, discuss the CBR training for the families, and engage in shared decision making. Now, if and only if the stars align and the child can be discharged safely and the family is comfortable, ensure ability to reevaluate within the next 12 to 24 hours. How many of you work in a pediatric hospital? Hands up. Pediatric hospital? Five. How many of you work in an area that have an access to pediatric clinic? How fast can you send your patient to a pediatric clinic to be seen? Half an hour? One hour? One day? Two days? Three days? Mine, it takes them almost three weeks to see a pediatric. So if I'm going to send this patient home, and I'm going to ask him to be evaluated again in 12 hours, where is he going to be evaluated? In ED, right? So now we change the ED to a follow-up clinic. So it's interesting how, how the guidelines really guide people towards events that we don't do. Right. So the difference between the terms, ALTI and BREW, comes really clear. A BREW has a strict age limit. An event is only a BREW if there is no other likely explanation. A BREW diagnosis is based on the clinician characterization, not on the caregiver perception that the event was a life-threatening. The clinicians should determine whether the infant had episodic cyanosis or balor, rather than just determine whether color change, redness. Okay? One of the common things, um, a Brooks expands respiratory criteria beyond apnea, of course, and finally, the use of alter alternated level of respons responsiveness is a new criteria that have been added to Brooks. We always come to the parents and ask the mother, how did the change occur? What did you see exactly? Well, he changed color. Okay? Uh, was it uh, blue? Yes. How blue? Very blue. Okay. Was it blue like what? Like the abaya? As if the abaya is blue. So he says, yes, like the abaya. 
I always thought of mothers knowing colors better than fathers. We as fathers don't know colors at all. We cannot differentiate colors. But mothers do differentiate colors. But in this aspect, especially in this baby infant, when I come and ask them about colors, they get dazzled. They don't know what color they want to give me. Is it really blue? Is it dark red? Is it really black as abaya? It's very hard to tell. That's why having the broom as a criteria to tell me really how risky is this baby, how high level of risk should I worry about, is really a nice thing to really guide us through. So looking at this and the brew diagnosis, so patient presents the initial medical assessment after a brief resolved event that was observed by a caregiver in a child less than one year of age. So the patient is well appearing. Then the clinician characterizes the event as a sudden brief and non uh, now resolved episode and one or more of the following. Cyanosis, valor, absent decrease in regular breathing, marked change in tone, altered responsiveness, then event criteria present, then we perform appropriate testing and physical exam, no explanation for the event identified, then we diagnose him as brew. Now, if the patient has additional symptoms or abnormal vital signs, cough, respiratory difficulties, or fever, then we go to the not a brew criteria. If he does not fit the criteria, then he's not a brew. If he has something on the physical exam that explains it, you, you put your, your hands on his um, masseter muscle and it's twitching, hypocalcemia sign, he is not a broom. So this, this guy now, he goes down out of the guideline scope and you manage accordingly, okay? Now, what happens to this when he's diagnosed as broom? If you have no concerns identified from history and physical exam, then you apply the risk stratification. If his age is above 60 days, born more than or equal 32 weeks gestation, and corrected gestation age is more than or equal 45, no CBR by trained medical provider, event lasted less than one minute, first event. If yes, then he's a low-risk patient, okay? If it no, then he's a high-risk patient. Now, what should we do? The, for the management recommendation of the low-risk patient, we should educate caregivers about brew, engage them in shared decision-making and guide evaluation, disposition, and follow-up, Offer resources for CBR training to caregiver. As if you're telling me that, you know what, I'm gonna send you home, but he may die, so be prepared. We're gonna take the risk, so let's share the responsibility. Okay. You may obtain pertussis testing and 12 lead EKG, as if pertussis testing is the same as RSV, you know, within half an hour it will come out. It will take two days to come up with pertussis. A 12 lead EKG, you know, very nicely. How many of you know how to read neonatal EKGs? Hands up. Neonate EKG. Difficult sometimes. Uh, you can do that too. And maybe you'll say, oh, it's normal. So briefly monitor patients with con continuous pulse oximetry and serial observation. Definitely, that's something you have to do. Now, what we should not do, obtain white count, blood culture, CSF analysis or culture, serum, sodium, potassium, chloride, blood urea, nitrogen, creatinine, the whole shebang that we have been doing all the time for all these patients. And initiate home cardiorespiratory monitoring, prescribe acid suppression therapy and anti-epileptic medication because we don't know if they are, are uh, anti-epileptic or they are cured. So at this point in time, we should not do something that we don't know what we're doing for. Need not to. Obtain viral respiratory test, urine analysis, blood glucose, serum bicarb, serum lactic acid, laboratory evaluation for anemia or, or neuroimaging. Admit the patient to the hospital solely for cardiorespiratory monitoring. So we don't need to do that. So br briefly, they're saying if he is fitting the BREW criteria, low risk criteria, then you can safely say we can maybe send them home with a close monitoring if you're a believer of that attitude change. Um, this is almost done anything, the same thing that we just talked about. Uh, to take home message, be alert. You can have a lot of guidelines that changes your mind. Apply criteria if you're gonna use it. Clinical judgment is always superior to anything. So remember, you have to believe the mother. A brew is now is a new to apply, but does not really get close up, close follow up. And ulti is still something that we need to think of. I stop here. Thank you very much.